Hi, everybody, and thanks for being here for Deborah Cobalt Live. You know, they say it's a dog's life, and today uh, joining me is former USA Today journalist Maria Godovich, and she's talking about her latest book called Dr. Dogs. It's an incredible book, and it's fascinating, actually, to talk about the way dogs are saving lives every day in their role as doctors in laboratories. Maria, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. I'm happy to be with you. Well, I'm so excited to have you on. Now, I must also say, this is a follow-up to three other books that you've written, Soldier Dogs, Top Dogs, and Secret Service Dogs. You are a dog person, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I, I really enjoy working dogs, especially, as you can tell, dogs who work to save people's lives, essentially. Yeah. Pretty incredible. Let's talk a little bit about Dr. Dogs. Um, what are doctor dogs, and what kind of work are they doing in, I, I imagine, mostly laboratories? Is that correct? Um, both. Actually, uh, my book talks about all the doctor dogs out there. So there are the doctor dogs who work alongside their people, and they're the ones who directly save lives. Those are the dogs who are telling their people if they're going to have a diabetic low or high. They often do this wow. at least 15 minutes in be ahead of the person's devices. They do it in real time. These are the dogs who are telling their people, you're going to have a seizure soon, so the person can get out of the shower and sit down or go find a safe place if they're out on the street. Uh, the dogs who are telling the person that they're going to go into their strained paralysis or they're going to lose consciousness. There are amazing numbers of dogs out there, and these doctor dogs, how, what I refer to as doctor dogs, are dogs on the cutting edge of medicine. And they're, these are these are new roles for dogs. And, and what you had mentioned also was in laboratories, and they're doing absolutely fascinating work as researchers. Um, they're, they're sniffing out all kinds of cancers in early stages. They're even looking at Parkinson's and trying to get that at its earliest stages, and superbugs as well. So, and also, um, back to the doctor dogs who work with people, there are also these doctor dogs who are working with people with mental health issues. So whether they can sniff out or just detect um, something like a panic attack before it happens, they're remarkable at doing this. And, and they think they're saving lives all the time by virtue of their dedication to their person and, and by virtue of their incredibly, astonishingly sensitive noses. How do they even train these dogs to do this? Let's talk about first uh, a couple things. You mentioned a diabetic attack. You mentioned a, pa a panic attack. How can they know that you're about to have something go wrong? What is it that's going on in our bodies that they can detect that we cannot? Right. Um, well, we're not even sure with the case of diabetes, or in most cases, what they are smelling. What, what the researchers are doing, let's say um, for, there's, a, there's, there's an organization up here in Northern California called Dogs for Diabetics, and I spent time with them watching how they train their dogs. They will um, take skin swabs, so they'll take gauze, and they'll have a diabetic who is experiencing a diabetic low swab their skin on gauze or cotton, and they will use those as training aids. So they'll keep them in the freezer. They have a freezer stocked with diabetic lows and highs. And even when I was there, they swabbed my skin just to use as a control. And the dog comes to associate. So the, when the dog recognizes, oh, this is something I'm supposed to pay attention to, even the dog at first just laying his nose on that sample gets a click and a reward. And then uh, the dog starts going, oh, when I, when I pay attention to this scent, uh, something like this, people are really happy. So they come to associate whatever scent that it is, that is that diabetics are giving off when they're low or high, and they associate that with treats and goodies and love and toys. So their wow. paycheck is enormous. And these dogs, the dogs who do this have to be really motivated to get their paycheck. Some dogs you know, they all dogs have great noses. Well, most dogs, but the dogs who do this kind of work have to be really motivated to get their rewards. What to kind get their of dogs paychecks. generally are doing this kind of work? I mean, generally, you know, we always see the shepherds as, you know, um, dogs that are working out in in the field. But I know there's various kind of dogs, right? Yeah, there are all kinds of dogs. Yeah. The ones who are the doctor dogs who who work directly with their people are primarily 
tend, they really tend to be Labrador retrievers or golden retrievers or some kind of doodle. But um, there are all kinds of dogs who can do this kind of work. And, and the ones in the laboratories range from, as you said, shepherds and um, even there's a Malinois who does this work in, a, a Belgian Malinois that's basically a war dog who does this work in, in the Amsterdam area, wow. down to little Pomeranian, the fluffy little dog. There's, I'm actually visiting her this weekend. I'm giving a talk, if my voice holds up, in um, uh, an island off of um, Seattle, and this dog wears a tutu to work. She's a Pomeranian. She's a diva. She thinks she's all that, and she is because she's really good at sniffing out Parkinson's disease. So it doesn't seem to matter the breed when it comes to these detection dogs. It's more a matter of their their drive for their reward and their praise. And up there, their reward is turkey meat. So she's really driven to find the Parkinson's. I tell you, food is always the great unifier, isn't it? I mean, no matter what, whether it's people or dogs, give them a treat and they'll 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 do what they're supposed to do. It's quite interesting, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But let's talk a little bit about because I'm tr- still trying to understand how this happens. So you've got them in the laboratory, and what do you do? How do they how do they train them to sniff out what is it in the blood of a person or? You know, let's, let's, talk um, about let's, talk about, let's talk about cancer, yeah. and um, there's, there's one cancer that I, I am particularly interested in for personal reasons, yes, um, right ovarian that. cancer. Mm-hmm. My, my mom died of ovarian cancer way too young, and uh, we, I came to discover that other relatives did, um, and so this seems to run in the family. It's, I don't have the gene, but it, it, I've been told it's hereditary, mm-hmm. and so um, as you know, probably, that there's no really good test for the early stages that will catch ovarian cancer in its earliest stages when it is the most treatable. Unfortunately, usually people come in and it's, it's, it's you're pretty far along and it's really hard to get long-term survival. But dogs are able to sniff this cancer as early as stage one. I went to in, the laboratory. Yeah, in, in the person that, um, or in the, the lab, the blood from the lab? Like, tr- I'm trying to understand. So, so what they do is I went to the University of Pennsylvania and uh, their Penn Vet Working Dog Center and watched them train on plasma. This is a portion of the blood. It's the yellow portion mm-hmm. if you ever have seen the blood separated. They, they are detecting cancer and they can smell it in a tiny amount of plasma. I'm talking tiny. When I was there, a dog was sniffing basically a half a drop of plasma, and she was wow. able to tell ovarian cancer from someone who had a benign ovarian tumor and other things. So picture, picture a, a kind of a wheel, as you will. It's a, it's a, a carousel, a scent carousel is what I call it, and um, has several ports on the ends of their spokes, and these ports hold the samples. And so the dog will walk around and when the dog gets to the ovarian cancer or whatever it is that they're supposed to detect, uh, she sits and stares or stands and stares. It depends on what the dog does. And, and she's got it. And we were so excited when this dog was able to smell this tiny amount of plasma um, with ovar- from someone who had ovarian cancer. Wow. They're really, really well trained and, and really motivated. This dog as her paycheck for that, um, there was a lot of excitement because she had been trained on something called cell lines, which um, there, there's so little, there's so little, sa- few samples um, uh, to really train on. So cell lines are things that keep on giving. So if they can train a dog on cell lines, that means that they can save the real ovarian cancer samples for tests and for, for later on. So they were so excited. And this dog got to choose from a big box of toys, and she chose her favorite ball, and she went off into a corner and chomped on it while everyone was truly, truly giddy that she had found it at such a low a sample rate. So in a case like that, they then call the patient and say, we believe that you may have this. I mean, you, so nobody no. even knew that this person could possibly No, 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 have- no. Okay, no. So right now, they. this is all being done. This is not to test patients. Mm. This is all in, in the beginning stages of research to see what dogs can and cannot do. Same. The people running these tests know who has the cancer. They know who has, you know, who is, who, they know if these people have cancer or not. The people are not involved. They've given consent to have um, their blood or in other cases urine or uh, other body parts um, given to research for these dogs, and that's it. 
and there's no diagnosis being done, no really legitimate diagnosis being done in laboratories with these dogs. It's way too early in the game. But what they're doing now is trying to find out how to train them, all the best practices, and um, what will come of this, and and how how low dogs can go, and how well they can do it. And they've been able to do really well in a number, in pretty much any cancer they give them, they've been able to do really well, unless humans make mistakes, and, and that has been a confounding factor, is people making mistakes, but we're learning from mistakes. And uh, we don't even know right now if all cancers smell the same or if each cancer has a different smell and a dog can be tend to taught to recognize it or maybe maybe both. So um, that's something basic that we're learning. And you're not going to see a dog in your doctor's office or in the laboratory um, at Kaiser or something soon. What What's going to come of this is a technology that will be much more reliable because dogs are only human. They have their bad days. They get distracted. They're not perfect. But, but they're hoping that by working with people who are chemical analysts who are currently working with dogs, they will be able to find out what the dogs are smelling, what these volatile organic compounds are, that this, these things that the dogs are smelling, and they will be able to make a device that can detect those. And so maybe next time in seven years, I'll go to my doctor and I'll be able to breathe into a tube, which will see if I have any of, those, of these compounds in my wow. breath, or they'll do a quick blood test or something. They, they envision something called an e-nose, an electronic nose, which is basically shorthand for a non-invasive inexpensive, highly reliable device that will be able to use, be used much as a dog's nose is being used now in a laboratory. Fantastic. Wow. So yeah, obviously this is not the first time that we as human beings have used dogs um, to go to work, such as your other three uh, books, Soldier Dogs, Top Dog, and Secret Service Dogs, all very different books, terrific, terrific books. Um, soldier dogs. Let's talk a little bit about that. How do they train them to do what they do? Well, uh, it depends what kind of soldier dog you're talking about. Soldier dogs, uh, just as soldiers and uh, Marines and uh, everyone in the military have different jobs. And so those, there are many who are trained. Most of them, I would say these days, are explosive detection dogs. So they're in Afghanistan or wherever they will be, and they're sniffing for IEDs, for these, for these hidden little bombs that can go off and kill any number of people. So the dogs lead the way through these mine-infested fields, and they're sniffing, and they're keeping people safe behind them. They're, it's, just, it's just amazing. So how they train them is much the same way. They train them to detect certain scents, and, and they reward them when they start recognizing these scents. And, and they can't, the reward in, when they're uh, playing, when they're just training is often the bounce of a Kong, a big a kind of a rubber ball that dogs love, but you can't do that out in the field. You know, you, you find a bomb, you're not going to toss a ball and have no. a dog go you know, running after it. So they quietly reward them when they're in war and doing this. But, um, and then there are, of course, dogs who are also trained to protect, and they're the ones, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of, of people in full what they call bite suits, but they're covered in this really protective material, and the dog comes at them. They look kind of like a Michelin tire man or something, and the dog comes at them and, and attacks them, and um, it ostensibly protecting whoever it is that needs protecting. And so some of these dogs have, have these dual-purpose jobs. And then there are dogs like um, the one who we're calling Conan now, and she was the one who was involved, in, that's the name they're putting out there anyway, in, in the raid that ended up um, killing the leader of the Islamic State about a week and a half ago, and she's a Belgian Malinois, and she's a multi-talented dog. So some, some of these dogs have all, you know, extremely specialized training, and when they're in these when they're with something like Delta Force, the, the Navy SEALs, MARSOC, they've got this ultra high-end training, kind of like the men and women in those teams. So you know, uh, it's, it, it's so, so amazing to watch them at work. I love it. Um, I don't know as much about the behavior of dogs as you would, certainly. And I, I have a dog. I grew up with dogs. But do they sort of feel like human, or do they know that they are different than humans but doing a job with and for humans? I'm just curious. I'm, I don't have that kind of insight into a dog's brain. I will not ever purport to. Um, so I don't really know. I know that they they feel I, I think, just from what I've seen, that they're definitely part of the team. They are, they are 
part of those men and women who are marching into these dangerous areas. They check on their teammates if at the end of the day, literally, when they're sitting around camp or, you know, wherever, and, and someone's having a bad day, that dog might just go to that person, you know, just to, it seems that the dog wants to make the person feel better. My dad was actually a very young soldier in, in World War II, and he would tell us when I was a child about how the dogs would save people by doing their incredible work during the day, and then at night they would come to people like him. He was 18 and homesick, and they would come to him and, and say, you know, just be like home. They would bring a piece of home, and they would make him feel better. And, and they're still doing that today. Now, whether they think they're human or not, I don't think they do. Um, th- their senses are so different than ours. And, but it's, it's okay. It, it, it's being, being a dog is a great thing to be. What's interesting is my dog, right, he's, uh, I don't know, we got him at a shelter, to be honest, but clearly he has some schnauzer in him. He looks after me, that little guy. If I'm up late, late at night and I'm doing my work on the kitchen table, he will wait for me. The minute I get up, he sort of senses my my tone or whatever. The minute I'm done with my work and I stand up to go upstairs, he's on alert and he'll go up with me and he keeps me company. It's almost like he's looking after me. It's it's very he sweet. Is. But I don't think he's, he's doing it to be kind. They watch your body language. They know. Pardon? They they the dogs are dogs are really good at watching body language and even if he's not Amazing. smelling something coming from you, they're experts at watching humans and yeah, he's he wants he really wants to be with you, wants to be at your side and will get up and do uncomfortable things like, you know, from lying down to going up the stairs or whatever, just to be at your side because so you're his best friend. And I often wonder, is he trying to protect me or just be a little friend or both? You know, it's very sweet. Um, yeah. What, no, yeah. You know what I love? Um, uh, in your book, Dr. Dogs, page 129, we talked about this because this amazes me. Uh, the dog that was crying, this has happened a number of times, over the grave site, of its owner and won't get up and will just stay there every day, whimper. Actually, it breaks my heart to see that. That's incredible, right? Day after day, these dogs will go to the gravesite and cry, right? Yeah, this I have one example in the book, and this dog was at his person's side. He's a beagle, and he was at his person's side every day, saving his life. The man had diabetes, and type 1, and he was... Um, he protected him. He did everything for him. He lived for him. He was there when he had heart attacks. He would go and get the man's wife when he found twice the man collapsed in the bathroom floor. And so he was there through thick and thin. And then he was at the hospital when when yes. the man died. And even though he wasn't right there, he was like right outside, I guess, in the hall. He knew. He knew, and he started howling. And they, they made him leave the whole area because he was howling. Oh. Um, something somehow he knew. And then at the at the church funeral, he was I guess he was trying to get up on the casket. And then at the oh. burial, he he was um, he was very sad. And um, whenever his person his mom would come visit um, her husband, he would try to dig. He would dig and dig to try to get to the man. And I actually went to the gravestone. I went, I, I stayed with this woman and I, I went to visit the graveyard and, um, she actually had to stop visiting the site for about a month. Someone told her to stay away for a month. The trainer did. And then the dog seemed to be better about it. But, right. um, then when I was there, the dog just kind of leaned up against the grave and, and was was lying in the sun, but it, yeah, it was incredible how this this dog did not want his person to go away, and how dogs know this and that loyalty of all these stories we hear about when the dogs are True. waiting at the train station for someone who never comes back or at the graveyard. It's heartbreaking. It's very heartbreaking. Um, I love my dog so much. I hope I hope also this sheds light on on the personality of dogs. You know, for people who either don't have one or don't understand that that they are so much more than just a pet. They are a companion, and they can actually now save our lives because in the future they're going to be, I guess, uh, doctor dogs and working in labs and helping us perhaps save lives. That's it's pretty extraordinary. So. Um, I thank you for being on with us. Are there any uh, last words you'd like to tell us? I'd like to remind everybody, this is a great book. Dr. Dogs is well, beautifully written, and it's not just about, um, it's actually you touch upon quite a bit, the diabetes, as we talked about, seizures, cancer. Um, you know, if someone's about to faint, lose consciousness, they can even detect the superbugs, 
Boy, I could could have used a, a dog about two years ago when I got one of those. Um, but just all that a dog can do and learn, it's extraordinary. Um, but what would you like to say that you want to make sure that people know? I would just say, you know, those who have dogs, just look at your dog and know how much possibility they have, how, how smart they are. And we, we are just beginning to be able to tap into that. They have a, a different kind of intelligence just because they can't speak to us doesn't mean that, that they can't do wonders. And That's actually, right. in my book, I, in the epilogue, I talk about their potential ability to speak with us. Uh, they're at, at Georgia Tech, they're working on, on vests for, and uh, touch screens for dogs who are these doctor dogs. And they may be able to literally speak one day through these devices. And, and that's uh, a little, it's good and maybe not so good, but for people who need them, it will be another lifesaver. Wow, a lifesaver, and imagine what they would say if they could to some of us. Like really, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> you know, I'm not so dumb, I understand, I get it. Anyway, Maria, thank you so much for being here. Dr. Dogs, how our best friends are becoming our best medicine. You can pick it up on Amazon and uh, in many bookstores. So this is a beautiful book. I suggest reading it and also your others, uh, Soldier Dogs, Top Dog, and Secret Service Dogs. Wow, what we could learn from dogs. So thank you very much. And thanks for coming on our show. I know that you had a little bit of laryngitis. You've been nursing your voice for the past two days. You sounded great. So thank you, Maria. Thank you. It was great to be on with you, Deborah. Yes, absolutely. And thanks, everybody, for being here on Deborah Cobalt Live. Remember, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and you can listen to us on Apple, Pod, uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, every place that has podcasts, you're going to find us. So thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Bye.